not that they're stupid. It's just they don't know anything. I'm wrong? X equals Pedro's girlfriends. Five X equals Juan's girlfriends. X minus one equals Carlos's girlfriends. X plus five X plus X minus one equals 20. So X equals three. Good to see you. Kimo, this stuff don't make no sense unless you show us how it works in the real world. Do you think it would be possible to get a couple of gigolos for a practical demonstration? No, 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 stop. No, 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 just kidding, just kidding. So please welcome Mr. Edward Jane Palmer. Boy, we barely started. I already feel like crying, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very touching, you see what happens. Wow, I'm actually old enough to remember all zoot your zoot. performances <laughs> in real time. I mean, Zoot Suit, I mean, that was like an explosion of something we haven't seen before. That whole pachuco, the whole look, the whole thing. It was the first uh, major piece of uh, theater to, to actually uh, play on the Great White Way of Broadway. It was uh, an amazing experience. Since then, we've had, uh, I think, two pieces. And the last one was the best, which is uh, the piece that uh, Lynn Miranda did, Puerto Rican. Uh, was. But at the time, my God, there was like an explosion of something totally new. I mean, yeah, that was, really, that a, was language, a major piece a of culture. work. Culture, yeah, it was amazing. And then Stand By Me, American Me, I knew Floyd, new tracks, I knew, you know, from Aloha, Bobby and Rose, that's how back we go. But let's talk about this movie because I really, one of the things that I love about doing this series is really when I revisit, uh, we all revisit movies that we haven't seen in so long and, you know, it's kind of surprising what stands up and what doesn't, you know. And this one really does. I mean, you should have seen the reaction here. It was really... I was listening to it. I was up in the box, and then we were yeah. outside. <laughs> right. Yeah, this film has got a really interesting uh, reputation. Matter of fact, it was released by Warner Brothers. This is the company right. that released it. And, um, but it's been seen by... Uh, it's the most viewed film of any film in the history of film in the United States. Oh. It'd be Gone with the Wind and... Avatar will never catch up to it. <laughs> it's just impossible. It's, uh, the reason being is that uh, how many of you had seen the film before? Wow. How many of you had seen the film in school? There it is. That's the reason. Yeah, most of us will have, uh, most of the kids in this, uh, more than half of all the children uh, in high school will have seen it because it's, it's shown in high schools across the country and so it's been uh, millions and millions of kids that see it every I guess the teacher year. really want to show them what education and good teachers do that's what they I <laughs> find it to be interesting because uh, it's it's something that uh, once you see this film and they usually show it in the classroom and then the teacher gets up in front of the class to teach right after seeing this film I think it's quite brave of the teacher <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a really difficult journey after that. I mean, this guy really, really made a difference. And the final year that he taught, he's teaching in Sacramento, and the final, te final year he taught, he taught 250 kids, prepared them for the AP calculus test. That's one teacher. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of kids for in one year to teach, get ready to take your advanced placement test. How many of you took your AP calculus test? Six. <laughs> and how many of you passed it? <laughs> All six, all right. Wow. Yeah, I'm a, I confess that even though I have a bachelor degree, I couldn't, I couldn't understand one thing over there. But it's a language. It, it's, don't, don't think that it's, you know, it's like, you know, you're listening to it. How know. did you get cast in this movie? Uh, we, we helped create the role. So it, originally it was uh, something that happened in 1983, which we all saw. 
And when it happened, it was I, I was uh, given a uh, major award by the NAACP, and they had given it to me for Humanitarian of the Year, and they gave at the same award. It was in June. They had given the best uh, teacher of the year to Jaime. And in May is when this happened. By June, they had gotten the results. And so they went on to uh, you know, celebrate, and he became a celebrity. I mean, the, the, it was a shot heard around the world that you know, 18 kids from East LA, inner city school, going out and, and doing this and, and having some of the highest scores of all time in the history of the test. <laughs> and so it really, everybody was in nirvana. And then about, uh, I'd say about six weeks later, after we, I met him there, and we became friends, and we talked. And he was, you know, he's a wonderful man. Uh, if uh, imitation is the ultimate flattery, then I, I did the finest imitation that was possible. I, I'm so grateful that I had some time to to practice my art before I had that responsibility, because that responsibility was amazing. It was a really uh, important piece. He was there every day. Really? Yeah, he helped me write the script. You know, we rewrote the script in six days. <laughs> it's quite amazing. This man was a total genius, and his genius came out. I would ask him a question, you know, when he'd tell me, you know, well, I'd say, what happened to you and when you had the heart attack? He says, well, man, I, I and he acted it out. I he hit my arm, and I was kind of like going down, and I hit the side, and I did exactly what he told me to do. <laughs> I did the same thing, and I uh, fell on my face, and I, my, my head went into the ground. He said, I slid down the steps, and then I, all the way to my face hit the ground. I said, okay, here we go. One take, guys, let's do it. We did it one take. Couldn't, couldn't do it again. I mean, it was dangerous. I mean, I, you see it. You see me. I, and I go right in the ground. I stay there. When he got out of the hospital, he was not supposed. You know, he was supposed to stay in there a while. He only stayed there 48 hours, two days, and he came right out. And when he came out, he says, uh, "I said, well, what did you do?" He goes, "Well, I went straight to the school." I said, "Oh my God! You know, what did you do?" <laughs> well, I walked in the door, and I go, "Hey, mi conguros, how you doing?" <laughs> I go, "Conguros." He goes, yeah, kangaroos. <laughs> That's what I'd call them. And so I said, okay, okay, here we go. And then uh, he said, and then what'd you do? He says, well, I told him to line up against the wall like a snake. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I mean, who could write that shit? Right. <laughs> I mean, come on, think about it. Just think about what you just experienced. And then you start to realize the truths that were being, that's why it holds up. As soon as you use a solid understanding of truth inside of the, this medium, which is the, really the documentation of human behavior, dramatized, so it's fiction, but it's dramatized. As soon as you use it in this manner and you're really honest to the, to the situation, it's timeless. A hundred years from today, they'll be looking at this film. Just to study L.A., if nothing more. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Everything felt so really authentic. And also, uh, I was just thinking about it when I was watching it, that it's really, after that came, you say flattery is imitation. I mean, all those other movies really about teachers, they kind of came from that. The only thing that I could think of, and I don't remember that movie at all, is maybe Sidney Poitier. To Serve With Love. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> it was different, though. Yeah. It's completely different. But it, it, this film, again, um, once I met him and once we started into this, and then when it happened and they were accused of cheating, uh, it was devastating. 
And it, they got more publicity on the fact that they were cheaters than they had gotten by passing the examination. And uh, so that really became the issue. So as soon as that happened, I called them up and we got together and, and you know, everybody. <sighs> Those three of us, Tom, uh, Oscar, and then uh, um, uh, Ramon Menendez, they were two producers and myself, we the three of us. We got the rights to do the movie for a dollar. <laughs> so we paid him a dollar. We had no money. Here, give me a buck. Let's go for it. He made a lot of money off the picture, though, in the end, because we worked out a deal here. The deal was very good. It was an adjusted gross deal. Whoa. Highly recommend Whoa. everybody learn what that is. There was wow. a book written on it. There's a book written on, on the deal. Really? Two of my films have been written on, yeah. It's called uh, Off Hollywood. Pick up the book. You'll be very I'm glad interested. you did. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's very important. It's very important when it comes to uh, right. knowing how to structure what to ask for when you have your product finished. You Why know? don't you tell us right now? It's easy. Uh, basically, what we did here was we, we worked an adjusted gross deal, meaning that once we paid back the five million that they had given us, well, that's 3.5, 3.5 million that they gave us that they in turn would then give themselves 100% back on their money and 20% uh, above that. And then from that moment on, there was no uh, prints and advertisement, no, nothing could be taken away from the, from the dollar after that. We split everything. A third went to the company, Warner Brothers, a third went to our production companies, and a third went to PBS, who helped us make the And movie. how did you have the nerve to ask for that kind of a deal? It came from the quality of the product. I mean, you can't, you can't really ask for something unless there's a real solid understanding of what you have, what you're giving, what you're selling. So it was on the selling. Uh, it was the product, this product. They saw it. I remember we went into... Oh, you um, had the finished movie before oh, you made yeah. the deal? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we couldn't get this thing made. With, of course. It was impossible. If it wasn't for PBS, it took us five years to get the money to make it. It was really hard. It was not easy. It's never been easy to make any of my films, but the financial part of it is really the key. And that's really, you have to be really understanding that it takes time, it'll be done. How many of you are filmmakers? How many of you are actors? Okay, <laughs> just the acting crews in here. Looks good. But um, you really have to realize that it takes time. And the, the key ingredient is just the quality of the story that you want to tell. What is the story that you're telling? How much passion do you have for it? And then from that moment on, you have to sell it. And the selling of it, that's where a producer, how many of you are going to be producers? That's a big mistake. Everybody's hand should have went up. <laughs> Everybody's hand should go up. You should all produce your own movies. Serious as a heart attack. Anybody that wants to be in this industry, I'm telling you right now, become a producer. Produce your own film so that you can act in them, so you can write them, so you can develop them, so you can create them, so you can direct them. I produce, direct, act, and write my own stories. And, uh, and out of necessity, it wasn't like I wanted to do it. <laughs> it's just out of necessity to do my acting, there was no way that me, a Latino in 1963 and 64, <laughs> when all there was, I think there was three Latinos that were recognized at that moment in time. Right. It was uh, Anthony Quinn, Rita Moreno, and Jose Ferrer. Brilliant artists, but they were just like far and few between. And even today, even today, the, the uh, minorities have the hardest time. And we always know that, it's a given. But that's changing. That's why it's so important what you're doing, especially the women. I see a lot of women in here. That's really important for you to realize that you're hitting it right at the right time. Educate yourselves to the fullest. Have the understanding and the confidence to move forward in your craft. And the only people I know that haven't made it are the ones who quit. Everybody that stays in it makes it. Choice is yours. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Hard to believe. I see, I, you know, I'm not good at anything. I'm really not good. I, I learn a lot, but I'm not very good. Uh, you know, I'm not naturally talented or naturally gifted. Everything I do, I learned it. And uh, I did not come out of my mother's womb saying to be or not to be. Okay. <laughs> but I understand this. I understand this. I understand this. <laughs> and I understand this. Con la baba cayéndose de la boca. So when I see you and I'm looking at you, you give up exactly what you're feeling. Because you have no problem, you're amongst in the group, so it's, as I look at you, you're giving me exactly the truth that you're feeling at that moment. And when I said a couple of things that I said, a lot of you, I guess what? <laughs> you know? It's hard to believe that the responsibility is on you, not on somebody else giving you an opportunity. You can use that as an excuse all you want. <laughs> well, I never got the breaks. <laughs> Guess what? I'll tell you right now, you should never have invited me here. Because I told you, no one's going to give you a break. Huh. You're going to have to give yourself the break by knowing how to act, knowing how to write, knowing how to direct, and knowing how to produce. Now, you may not do them. It's up to you. But what are you in this industry for? to tell story. If you're not a storyteller, get out. <laughs> Quick. If you're a storyteller, you've come to the right place. You can do it in theater, you can do it in film, and now you can do it with your damn phone. <laughs> Go on, man, jump. Uh, gotcha, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, they're, they're, and, and with the advent of the internet, there's no excuse why you can't get your product seen. It's really changed. For you guys, it's really going to be a different world. There's no two ways around it. You know, Spielberg came here and he told, he told the same thing to the student. He said when he had to show his short, it took him, you know, seven minutes just to uh, put the projector and put the film and then and then and, you know. And now it's like, you know, you have a link. <laughs> That's right. People see the two seconds, you know. So uh, there's incredible opportunities out there for you guys. Very much so. Um, would the student, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, would you please line up behind the microphone? It's your opportunity. Hello. Um, first, I, I got to let you know, I'm sorry if I'm tripping, that I'm really excited because I was raised off of Bifabilia. So I'm. Souped. Um, <laughs> um, my I'm question, more excited than you are, to be honest with you. I'm nervous. I am, really? Yeah, I got, my, got butterflies in my stomach. Of my course. heart is racing a million. Yeah. This is no, nothing natural about doing this. <laughs> you want to try it? Come on up here. Sit down here at the chair. Let us ask you questions. And I didn't even ask you the tough questions yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, um, you've played some pretty interesting characters over the years and people who have um, distinct qualities. How do you prepare for each of those people that you do? And um, how do you know what characteristics to hold on to to really give that person life? You know, the m main thing is time. You need time. So right now, when you're in the process of, of understanding your, your growth, is where you take the time to develop discipline. Discipline, determination, perseverance, and the key ingredient to all of this is patience. You must be willing to give yourself the time to learn it and the time to do it. And a lot of people get really frustrated after 10 years. After, I did 14 years of theater before I got my first paycheck in the theater. Wow. <laughs> I worked seven days a week from 1960 when I was 14. And I work today seven days a week. Even when I go on vacation, I'm either thinking about it, doing it, or reading about it, or watching it. Something to do with my craft. I never let it go. 
And, uh, you know, I learned that from playing baseball. When I was playing baseball, um, I ended up uh, being very good at a very young age. I was very good. I mean, I, I, didn't, I couldn't catch a ball at the age of six. They'd throw it to me and it would hit me. I couldn't catch it. And then I started to play it every day, seven days a week. Not six, not five, not four, seven. Big difference. And people say to me, how is that possible that you could sit there and say to us that you did something seven days a week? How can you do that? I say, it's pretty easy. How many of you brush your teeth? <laughs> How many of you brush your teeth every day? <laughs> Seven days a week. <laughs> How many of you brush your teeth twice a day? <laughs> Seven days a week. <laughs> now you're gonna tell me that you're gonna sit there and think that you, know, you have the ability, what, what, do you wake up in the morning like this, you get up in the morning, <sighs> <laughs> oh, 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 you get orgasmic brushing your teeth? <laughs> or do you wake up in the morning like this? where you don't really care about brushing your teeth, you do it because you have to, because if not, you're gonna have halitosis, you won't get up to walk to somebody, you're gonna go, hey, hey stay right there. <laughs> Thanks, can you look that way? <laughs> what do you do? You do it every day, because you have to. Then don't question someone when they say to you, I love doing this. I have the discipline to do the things I love to do when I don't feel like doing them. Learn that. I'll say it again. Discipline to do the things you love to do when you don't feel like doing it. <laughs> That's what you get when you brush your teeth every day. Because none of you really like brushing your teeth, but you got the discipline to brush your teeth every day so that discipline now transfers itself to something that you love to do. And if you can brush your teeth every day, hell, you could do this every day because you love doing that. Even on the day that you don't feel like doing it, you do it. And on that day, you get the most out of it. The day I don't feel like doing something and I do it, I learn much more than on the day that I feel like doing it. Matter of fact, today at the age of 65, I know I look good, <laughs> but I am 65 which is the new middle age now, okay? I'm gonna hit 120. I'm gonna hit 120 if I can, boom, I'm going for 120 easy. But the day, the day to day, it's harder for me to find days that I don't feel like doing it. And I look for those days, on those days when I don't feel like doing it, I go, yes, okay, I don't feel like doing it today. Thank you. And I go off and I do it and I go, all right. God, I wouldn't have realized this. Wow, this is what I look, man, think, I wouldn't have realized this. This is a great day. That makes you a consummate artist, a master. And anybody can do it. But every single person sitting in this seat has a thumbprint, and it's your own thumbprint. So all of us can become masters, and we each touch it differently. If I had, 18 people do this part, the same exact part, everybody would touch it differently. And that's the beauty of living. We all have our own thumbprint. Until we start cloning, then it's all over. <laughs> it's close. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, how's it going? My name is Ozzy Ramirez. Como estamos? Uh, I was wondering about, uh, my question is your process, like when you do other films, do you talk to other actors on how do they work on their process, um, what they're going to put up on their characters, or do you stay real like private with it like a lot of actors do? You know, the rehearsal is what I love to do. 
I like to rehearse. Uh, a lot of people don't like to rehearse. A lot of people like the feeling of spontaneity, <laughs> improvisation, which comes every time you do it. I mean, if you keep on doing it, you, you'll start improvising a lot because you get more confident and more confident and more confident, and pretty soon you're trying everything under the sun, and it works. His question, and your question, which is the method that I use, okay? Uh, I started with, you know, uh, Sanford Meisner, which was repetitive, which was uh, Stella Adler and him moved from the kind of Stanislavski method that everybody used in the 30s and 40s, well, 40s really, and that, uh, um, you know. Lee Strasberg. Lee really was the person who held on to it. Yeah. The traditional, and a lot of people loved it. But <clears throat> Stella, and uh, Sanford went from with with Stanislavski, at least Stella did when he when when he was older, and he she said I, it's too cumbersome. The way I was teaching is much too cumbersome. You you know he 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 felt that by repetitive dialogue, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over and over and over, saying one word over and over and over and over and over. I do, 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 I do. And you, could, you start to realize what the power is in that section of, of understanding. He ended up teaching it to these Stella Adler and to Meisner, and they used it. And then th that's when the, the method broke. And there was two ways of using the method. And then Europe and England, they teach from the outside in. Okay, you got a you got a limp. You start to limp, and then you'll find out. You, I'm limping now. Okay, and I'll find out. That's from the outside. I put the limp right away. In, in Strasbourg's original, you could uh, you know Lee would not allow you to do the limp until you knew where that limp came from. And that's completely different. And that's cool. You know, they're both good. I used everything. I used anything and everything I could think of. <laughs> and then I went out and I used to sit on a park bench and just look at people yeah. walking and say, wow, that's a really wild walk. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> you know, I go, wow, man, if I could use that one day, wow. And that's what you do. You start to become a great observer. And that, to me, was the key. Once you know that you're going to be storytelling and that you're going to play characters. Now, there's some of us that don't play character. We play our personality. And there, there's nothing wrong with John Wayne was one of the giants and Rock Hudson, you know, uh, <laughs> James Stewart. All these guys played great personas of themselves. They, they created themselves into this thing, and there's a lot of us today that do that to still today, and that's nothing wrong with that, man. That's, that's hard. It's hard to have that much style. Clean this wood. Ooh. <laughs> and, but <clears throat> then there are other people who do characters. That's all they do. It's like each one is a little different. You know, I, I've been very fortunate. I passionately have loved everything that I've done with passion, and that really is the key. Uh, I've been offered work and made, I could have been a lot richer and a lot more famous. I really could have if I had done the things that they wanted me to do. Uh, but I, I didn't have the passion for it, and so I let fame and fortune go. And even though they want to pay me lots of money, I just said, I, I can't do this. I, I really wish I could. I wish I was that great of an artist that I could just do anything I wanted to do and anything that's offered to me, I could do it. But that's not how it works. <laughs> and you really have to be, you have to understand it as well as you understand the food you eat. If you eat fast foods all the time and that's all you do, you don't even think about what you're eating, it's over. You'll be dead real quick, a lot quicker than a person who really tries to understand the value of the food that they're eating and really make it, you know, the eating is the, the key. Like drinking this, you got to drink a lot of this, a lot, every day. If you don't, it's okay. There might be a year, two years, three years, you can get through the way you're doing it, but soon your kidneys shut down. You don't understand why you're feeling the way you feel and your body's giving up. You need strength, you need power, and you need water. And you need good food. You also need that for the soul in which you work with in the art form.
if you do not have that passion for it, you know, why are you going to do it? What are you getting out of it? The experience, it's better to experience something that you have passion for than something that you don't. So I, I turned around, I said to myself, I, I'm not going to do it this way. And uh, granted, I, I'm not known throughout the world. Granted, I turned down some major, major pieces of work. But it gave me the opportunity to create things that I could have never done had I done it the other way. I've been very specific. And I think, I think Adama in Battlestar Galactica is really, really a complex character. That guy is, I don't know, how many of you have seen Battlestar? Okay. Um, if you haven't seen it, if, if you haven't seen it, please do not look at it without starting at the miniseries. If you like the miniseries, then go to episode one. If you like the miniseries, episode one, then go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Don't break it. Go in serial, in continuity. And you'll have a, it's like a great book. You'll, have, you'll love it all the way around. So basically, I mean, my character and that character and the character in, in uh, Miami Vice, uh, completely different. Completely different kinds of characters. Has anybody seen Miami Vice? That was a show back in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> before you were all born. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the way I developed those characters was through my key ingredient for me to develop character, going back to how do I, my process, my method, is through music. I have to find the music, or I have to create the music. I, I, I sang rock and roll for since 1960. I was a rock and roll singer. It was great. It was really, really bad. <laughs> the rock and roll allows you to do anything you want to do, man. It's rock and roll, man. So I started singing rock and roll in 1960. I went from playing baseball <laughs> where I learned the discipline, remember? At six years old, I couldn't catch a ball. By the time I was 14, I was a state batting champion three years in a row, and the California state batting the best batter in, <laughs> kid in, in California for three years. And uh, I was catching Eddie Roebuck and Sandy Koufax in 59, 60. This is the best pitchers of the, of the era at the time. And I was a little kid. I was 14, 13, 14 years old. And uh, I was playing with guys that were 19, 20, and we were playing in the California Sun League, which was the uh, winter ball league for professional ball players. And so um, I was playing in that league, and, and of course they would they could have killed me because it's a really it's a tough game. Hard ball is a hard ball, and if it hits you, you're going to get hurt. And so they could have hurt me, but they never did. But I learned that I could. I went from not being able to catch a ball to being a really good, if not great, ball player. And I took all of that ability and I said to myself, wow, if I could do this in baseball, what could I do in rock and roll music? Let's try it. Boom. <laughs> and I did the exact same. I hung up my cleats and I'll never forget my father. He freaked out. My father did not talk to me for two years because I, I stopped doing baseball seven days a week. I just stopped cold turkey. <coughs> put my cleats down one day, never picked them up again. I went to right next door to my, my neighbor's house, who he played guitar. The year was 1960. You know, we were listening to rock and roll, the beginning of rock and roll. I mean, it's just like, you know, just three chords. And you see scream and holler, you know, and James Brown was going, and Little Richard was going, and, and you know, Elvis Presley was hot, and it was before the Beatles, before the Stones. You know, and we were playing and just like, ah, this is fun, this is fun. And we did it every day, seven days a week, instead of playing ball. I was in there in the garage, <laughs> playing, singing, you know, the songs. And, and I couldn't sing, and I still can't sing. I really can't sing, but I can scream, <laughs> and I can dance. So I would like scream, I'd, I'd sing a little bit, and then I'd scream, <laughs> and then I'd dance for like 10 minutes. <laughs> And then I come back screaming a little bit more, and then I go back to dancing. And uh, with that, music became an integral part of my understanding of my life. And when I, when I graduated from high school in 1964, I went into my first year of college, uh, which was at East Los Angeles Community College. Give me a break. <laughs> not Harvard, not Yale. <laughs> East LA Community College, yes. <laughs> East LA College, I, I went there because I was dyslexic, but I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't find out I was dyslexic until my children were diagnosed with dyslexia. <laughs> then I found out that I had it. They didn't know what it was. They thought I was just lazy. 
<laughs> lazy or dumb. Those are the two things I had to work with, either lazy or dumb. I, th I chose lazy. So now I'm lazy. I bust my ass, I'd get a C. It was really hard, <laughs> but it didn't matter. Because again, the discipline got me through it. At six, at, at, when I went into college in 1964, I combined music with theater. And pretty soon, boy, I started doing theater with music and I kept on doing my music. I played on the Sunset Strip at Gazzari's on the Sunset Strip from 1964 to 1968. And then in 1968, I moved over to the Factory, which was a nightclub that was very well known in that, in that period of time. Private club, and I worked there for two years, seven days a week. <laughs> uh, seven days a week at Gazzari's. I, I put myself through college, working at nights. And uh, it was great. So theater, college, and rock and roll became my life. And then when I graduated from college, I went on to do, uh, that was in 68, I was drafted, but then I had damaged my knees so badly that I, I, when the, the in inspection came, medical inspection, I couldn't even bend down. I had really destroyed my knees from playing baseball first and then from dancing and dropping down on my knees and doing <laughs> splits and, and just destroying my kneecaps. So I didn't, they didn't, I went in there, I took my toothbrush, walked through the line, but they didn't let me in. Mm. Thank God. <laughs> I was very grateful. I was very thankful and very grateful. I don't know how it happened. I said, thank you. <laughs> and so I just went on with my life. But it went from music to, to theater and then from theater into television and motion picture. But in that process, every time I got a character, I started to look for the character's music. And as soon as I found the music for the character, I knew the character. I said, oh, this is his music. Oh, yes. And as soon as I found Adama's music, boom. You know, because uh, sometimes you don't, you don't have enough time. Remember at the beginning, I said, you really need time. You have to have time. And, and sometimes the, the, you get the job in, in television, especially you go for an audition on Thursday, and Monday you start work. And you know, you got the job, oh great, when do I start next Monday? Okay, here we go, you know? And you have to come up with a character and you have to be able to understand that character and put it on film. For duration of existence of celluloid, it'll be there. And now it's, you know, <laughs> technology. So uh, basically it's music. Music is the key for my whole existence in, in filmmaking. It's been rhythm. So there you Muchas go. Gracias. You got it. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Vasha Nareis. What effect do you think the ego has on your acting? What effect does? The ego. The ego. ego. Yes. Woo, big one. <laughs> Can't do it without one. That's the issue. The issue is how do you maintain it? How do you control it? How do you, you know, make sure that you're working off of a center understanding? not a, an egotistical understanding that in turn will pretty much drive you crazy. If you get so full of yourself, pretty soon you'll believe everything they say about you. And then you get to the point where you can't even, you know, go outside because you just, oh, I can't go outside, you know. People often ask me, how do you walk through an airport? I go, I put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> they go, no, no, what, don't you have, don't people bother you? I said, no. They don't, people come up and they'll talk to you, but you know, they don't bother you. I can't understand when an artist, whether they be whatever kind of artist, anybody that's, that's causing attention, because you guys all applauded me. You guys all have come and said thank you to me by sitting here and watching my work. And if I hadn't done this work, you guys wouldn't know who I am. I could walk in the room and you wouldn't give a shit. <laughs> who cares? So I've asked for the attention. It's not like I didn't ask for it. I, I made myself, hey, look at me. I can act, I can walk, I can run, I can dance. <laughs> and, 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 and I caused the attention. And a lot of people get a lot of attention. You know, the Tom Cruises and everybody, they get tons of attention, you know. When Jennifer Lopez got all of her attention, I was with her when she could walk down the street. And now she can't. And I feel bad for her. I said, why can't you watch, walk down the street? Oh, Eddie, man, I, man, when I walk down the street, people go nuts. I said, yeah, well, maybe you should try to understand why they're doing that and how do you get past that? Or what are you gonna live? I remember that when, when, when Don Johnson got his um, bodyguards, 
he needed bodyguards. Okay. And then I, I heard somebody say, boy, there'll be a day when he won't need the bodyguards and nobody's going to tell him. <laughs> so, wow, that's really, that's really interesting. <laughs> Better not to get bodyguards than to get, than to get bodyguards and all of a sudden find out you don't really need them. You're still walking around with them. Everybody's going, here he comes. <laughs> you know? But, you know, and I understand that certain parts, some of us get to a level where it really, I mean, you walk into a room and it, the people just fall over themselves. They just can't even talk to you. People come up to me, they cannot talk to me. They start to cry. And they want to thank me, but they can't say it. They just stand there and they're crying and they're trying to talk, but they're so overwhelmed because they're, I've done something to their, in their lives and they've created this. So I could either turn around and say, please, you know, get yourself together. <laughs> really interesting ego or the same ego going thank you so much love you too give me a hug love you look at me okay you all right i love you thank you you made me feel so good inside but <laughs> different both ego both saying in themselves okay i know who i am and you know not acting like, you know, what, 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 what's wrong, what happened, you know? No, you really understand what you're doing. I have an ego, a big one, you know, and, it, and it's with me all the time. <laughs> but I tend to understand it enough to be able to say to people, first, I'm grateful. You must be grateful for just getting up in the morning, really, but you must be grateful for <laughs> sitting in this room. I don't know how you got here. Think about how you ended up sitting in this room. How you chose your line of work. How you chose to be here and do this. What got you here? What gave you the feeling that you could do this? Whatever that was, it's pumping your ego. Because you're being successful at it. And if you keep on doing this, you're going to say, well, I mean, I remember I came from New Jersey or I came from, you know, from Kansas or whatever. And I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what a camera was or I didn't know how to act. But now I'm, they like me and I'm doing good. And, oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and then, you know, that, that almighty wave. <laughs> There's something wrong, drastically wrong when I see the queen doing that. <laughs> the parade wave. <laughs> I said, yeah. oh, man, you're affected. Yeah. <laughs> you know they're affected. They, they, they think that they're, you know, yeah. they're affected. They think they're said, royalty. Yeah, they're royalty. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of princesses and queens especially. A lot of queens out there, guys. <laughs> so, you know, basically, how do you deal with an ego? You deal with it. You deal with it, and you try to be a nice person. And don't forget where you come from. Be grateful every day, man. Thankful when you go to sleep, grateful when you wake up. I get to do this again, all right. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to come here. <laughs> Think right. about it. Think about it. Thank I could have been coming. mysterious in my room saying, no, 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 they won't. I'll have to go to the theater to see who I am. <laughs> oh, don't. I, man, when a guy, when somebody stops a camera person from taking a picture of them, because, you know, get those cameras out of my face. Okay, then why'd you put yourself in this position in the first place? <laughs> Where are you coming from now? You've had enough? A lot of my friends, they say, hey, Eddie, I mean, I just can't, I don't, I don't, I give, I give, I give, Ed. There it is, right there. You want to see? Okay, I gave you my life. There it is. Don't come up to me and ask me for an autograph. Don't come up to me and take my picture. Leave me alone. How many times have you heard about it? I mean, people get in fights. You know, get that camera out of my face. I told you to get that camera out of my face. And they get, they get violent. Who caused that? The camera guy? I don't think so. If you weren't doing what you were doing, he could give his flying doo-doo. He'd say, frack you. <laughs> what a great word. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.
Hi, my name is Stephanie Hernandez, and um, I just wanted to say watching you know, this movie, I watched it in high school, and it didn't have the same effect that it did as now that I'm older and stuff. And um, being Hispanic, I can relate to the movie, um, especially the struggles. My father actually went to, um, grew up in East LA and went to Garfield High School. And um, playing a Hispanic in, in this movie, um, what was your spur inspiration for the part besides you know, um, meeting with you know the actual teacher, and then also um, you said ganas a lot in the movie. And so, what were your ganas for this role, like preparing for it and whatnot, and getting to this point in your life in general? It was the reason to tell the story. The story was fantastic. I mean, here's a teacher in the middle of an inner city school, and this really <coughs> happened. This guy taught these kids how to do this, and this is not easy. And hardly anyone believed in them. Very few people, even their own parents, believed that they could do this. And the school teachers, the other school teachers, the, the head of the de of mathematics department, all the whole story, I said, what a story. And then the guy helps them, he gets them there, and boom, they accuse him of cheating because they didn't miss enough. What? Yeah, they didn't miss enough. They should be given, you know, awards. They should be, you know, for not missing, and they go, no, 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 you know, everybody else missed, you know, they missed less than 13 on their multiple choice where everybody else was over 20. And so that threw up the red flag. And then they all missed the same question the same way. And they call it cheating. And they say, well, did you ever think maybe the teacher taught them all the same way and that's why they all answered it the same <laughs> way and that's why they all ended up with the same answer? Because there's only one answer, correct answer, period. So when everybody hits a correct answer, it's not that they're cheating, it's just that they know the subject matter and that they've been able to do it. Granted, there is cheating. But in this case, not only did they not cheat, but then he had one day, 24 hours, to prepare the kids to take a test in August after they'd finished taking the test in May. What happened to you when you oh. took a test, when you walk out of the room? As soon as you walk out of the room after taking the test, <laughs> phew, gone, man. What? I, I don't remember anything. I, it's over, man. I already took the test, man. Don't ask me any more questions because I don't know shit. It's over. It's gone. I don't want you know. So that whole thing, they, they had 24 hours to prepare to take that test. They didn't give him, you know, time. And he started from page one of the book. Now, those of us that took, you know, advanced placement in anything know how difficult it is. But to take AP calculus, it was really hard. It's one of the hardest exams that the United States of America gives to its students. So upon taking it, with only 24 hours, you saw the scene. He, he, he told me, what did you do? I said, he says, I just got the books. I gave them out again. And I just said, you know, you don't bring any pencils or pens. Don't put anything in your pockets. I'm going, slow down, slow down. And it was all there. And so my whole understanding was it was a great story. And that's what drove me. Did you guys see Walkout? Yes. Oh, what a movie. What a story. It took us 10 years to make that movie. Anybody see American Me? Yeah. yeah. 18 years to make that story. Right. Caught, anybody see Caught? With Maria Conchita Alonso? Yeah. 27 years. <laughs> I've been working on one story for 30 years and I pray to God that I'll be able to complete it. The story on, on Roy Benavides, a Medal of Honor winner. I developed it here once and they, they, they don't get it. They just don't get it. They don't realize that what really is needed is self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth. You put that into, infuse that into a student, you infuse that into people, and they don't hurt themselves. They don't get themselves into trouble because they like themselves. They don't want to hurt anybody. They don't want anybody to hurt them. They don't want to hurt anybody. But if you lack in self-esteem, self-respect, and self-worth, then you look for trouble. And then you don't mind inflicting harm on others. That's a given. That's a knowledge. And, and we need heroes. We need women heroes. We need, you know, ethnic heroes. We don't get them. Name me one. Okay, you're all educated. Name me one United States national hero that you've studied any time in your life, male or female, born in the United States of America, of Latin descent. One, national hero. 
Kent. How about one indigenous hero? Name me one that you've studied any time in your life. National hero that you've studied any time in your life in the United States of America. There are none. If it wasn't for Martin Luther King, we wouldn't have one person of color who's a national hero in this country. He's the only one we have. God bless Martin Luther King. I mean, one guy we say thank you to, a person of color that we say thank you to, who made this country? White people? I'm white. I'm half white, half brown. I mean, I'm brown because I'm half Indian and half, uh, I'm, I'm mestizo, I'm a mixture. A Mexican is half indigenous and half European. There was no Mexicans before the Europeans impregnated or raped the culture. Okay? None. And people say, whoa, whoa you, you're getting really, really harsh here. Not harsh. Truth is sometimes very difficult to take unless you've been fed the truth. Then it's easy. Then you sit there and go, that's the truth. Go for it. But if you haven't heard the truth, then it becomes an affront. It's like shocking. Is this guy, you know, is this guy <laughs> a prejudice or discriminatory, this guy? No, I'm not. What I am is, is frustrated. I've been trying to do a story on a, on a Latin hero, one, one, <laughs> give me one, all right? I was lucky I got to do this one. We're, this was lucky, come on, guys. Yeah. This was a Latino hero. He wasn't a national hero, like Roy Benavides. I mean, he's got ships named after him. He's one of the great Medal of Honor winners of all time. What he did was, <laughs> President Reagan said that the moment, if they ever try to make a movie about your story, when they were giving him the medal, they said, if, you ever want, if they ever make a movie about your story, nobody's going to believe it. Nobody's going to believe it. You're not going to believe it when, I, when, when this story is made. I may not be able to make it. You, one of you might make it. Because it, it may, we may not, 30 years, it's a long time trying to make a movie. And I tried, and they gave me here, backing here, back, uh, must have been about 19. Let's say maybe 1996, 97. That's when they backed me here. And then as soon as the script was finished, the, the, the administration changed. <laughs> and they go, oh, well, no, no, that's uh, really, you, you could take it. We, you know, we paid for it, but you can have it. You can take it. I said, thank you very much. And I kept it. They could have kept it. They could have kept it because they paid for it. And I said, thank you very much for giving it back to me. And I well, left. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. And here we are. And we're going to do it one day. We will do it. So basically, what inspired me to do this movie was the story. What was really the motivational part of it was the man. Forget it. I mean, this guy was a genius. Can you imagine teaching 250 kids in one year to take this test? <laughs> That's more than almost the entire... You can get like, you know, more than half of all the schools in, in, uh, in the country don't produce 250 kids to take that test. He was doing it by himself, one guy, his final year. That's amazing. That's, that's like teaching to classes of like 50 to 60 kids per class, you know, like they do in college. You know, you go there for three hours in college and you, there's 150 of you sitting there taking notes. <laughs> You know, and then you all have to pass it, and good luck. <laughs> well, that's how he did it. He had huge, huge stadium-seated areas to teach. He wasn't teaching in a 40 or 30-seat little room. He had hundreds of kids. And, and he would, he, what he had done, he had prepared high school, junior highs, junior high that, that fed into his high school, junior highs that fed into his high school, he would go talk to, talk to the math teachers and tell them what he needed. And then they would teach what he needed. And so by the time they got to the classroom, anybody they wanted to could take that class that took those teachers. And so that's how he did it. And, they, and it was a combination of, of really coming together. Thank you. Gracias, senor. Thank you. Hi, how you doing? My name is Alonzo Williams. Um, I was wanting to know, with the different characters you portray, do you have the same process for each character, or do you change up with everything you've learned from Sanford Meisner to the, listen to music? Do you do the same thing, or do you switch it based on character you're portraying? There's some very basic roots that you have to keep. You know, <laughs> know where you're coming from, know where you are, know where you're going. Don't bump into the furniture. <laughs> okay, simple things that you must do. They're, they're basics. 
that always come about. Music is one of them for me. So I do all my basic that are always the same for going, getting into any character. And then whatever the character needs, then I go for that. I have to do research. Like right now, I leave day after tomorrow. I leave for Washington, and then I go straight from Washington to Israel, where I'm working on a story right now that uh, pretty difficult. This is maybe the most uh, difficult film I've ever had to make or be a part of. My partner and myself, my partner is uh, the father of independent film in America. He's 88 years old right now. And uh, he was a man who invented documentary journalism for television in the 40s and 50s. And uh, he who was the that? first, Robert M. Young. Of course. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> and uh, him and I are jumping on an airplane. We're going to Israel. We'll be in Israel studying, uh, getting information and in film on a piece that we've been working on for three years. And uh, it's been very difficult because the story's difficult. And it's something that I think that's going to drive people just crazy. It's people are going to get very, very hurt with this film. But it's something that has to be done. It's like it'll be the crowning jewel of Bob's film archive ever. And the, and the Academy just called him up and asked him for all of his films. Oh, really? Yeah, they want to house his films. He's a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker. Well, why don't you do some comedy? I did. I have. Which one? <laughs> Didn't every, anybody ever see the wonderful ice cream suit? <laughs> no. Did you ever see it? No. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Ray Bradbury. You ever heard that name? Yeah. Fahrenheit Not known people. for comedy, by the way. Who? Ray? Yeah. Well, I know, but he did a great comedy, and I did really? it. Yeah, myself. And there was quite a Joe Montagna, and there was quite a Clifton uh, Collins. And, uh, Is there. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, no, I was just listening. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, uh, I remember one time somebody got up and said, you know, I'm from Colombia and I'm um, an actor and I don't want to be typecast, only doing, you know, Latino Spanish roles. Latino roles. What is your feeling about that? Well, I, I don't, I've been very fortunate. Um, I, I don't feel that it's a uh, difficult position to be in, to be Latino, or to be anything, really, and play those roles. Uh, I don't think that it's, there's so much to be said inside of this art form that to play those roles, which have never been played before, no one's ever made a zoot suit, no one's ever made a ballad of Gregorio Cortez or a stand and deliver, or, or that, that never been made. These are the first films that have ever been made about Latinos, you know, the culture, doing any of this work. And it gets a little frustrating, you know, so I don't mind spending my entire life, and I never have, inside of my culture, just telling stories from my culture's point of view. It's, I am Latino, so what, they're going to call me a Latino actor? <laughs> a lot of people don't like the hyphen, because they feel that it, it limits them, and it makes people look at them, because nobody goes up to, uh, can you imagine somebody going up to Robert De Niro and saying, ladies and gentlemen, that great Italian-American actor, Robert De Niro. <laughs> oh, the great Jewish-American actor, Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> but they do say that, you know, right. son of a bitch, actor, Latino actor, <laughs> Edward James Olmos. They do that, they do do that. They, they, they put Latino in front of my name all the time. Yeah. And that's okay by me. I'm very proud of my heritage and my culture. And, but yet I play, you know, um, let's see, in Dexter I played uh, Professor Geller. Anybody see me on uh, Dexter? Yeah. Who, who saw Dexter, anybody? You, you saw it. I was pointing at you. Yeah, <laughs> did you win? Did you? think that Professor Geller was not Professor Geller because I'm a Latino and I'm playing Professor Geller? Did you even think about that? <laughs> no, you didn't, did you? No. So the people who th are afraid of being categorized as a Latino, they, they got to take a look at themselves and, and really look at the possibilities of creating characters. Because every time I create a character, 
that becomes me and everybody goes, oh, I saw you, man, you're, you're a Dama. Or gosh, I saw you on Dexter, you're, you are so, I loved you on Dexter. I said, how could you love me on Dexter? You're sick. <laughs> I mean, if you came up to me and said, I hated you on Dexter, man, you were like, Ugh. I haven't hated anybody since Hannibal Lecter as much as I hated you. You were ugly, you kill women in terrible ways. I mean, that's all I did. Killing women, that was it. <laughs> it was crazy, man. But. I was never there. <laughs> and you won't understand that until you get there. If you haven't seen Dexter with me in it, if you didn't go through the whole series, then you will never understand what I just said. But if you have, then you understand what I said. That's the only reason I could do the part. Right. It had to have a sense of understanding of itself totally. It could not just be uh, a gratuitous or yeah. size glamorized piece yeah. of work. I can't do that. That's what my aesthetic doesn't allow me to do that. No, I understand. Were you going to ask a question, or did you ask a Oh, I asked my question. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sekimona. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, first Wabiki. of all, I just want to say thanks to NIFA for bringing such, such an inspirational person to us. <laughs> you know, thank you guys. I mean, and thank you for coming. You know, because you're not, you don't even know how fucking inspirational you are to myself. Thank and I'm pretty sure that all the Latinos as well, and you know, people from other countries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, here's the thing, I wanna tell you something. Usually when I bring people here, I know them, and because I spent so many years in the industry, and I have not met him, but people here said that they wanna meet somebody, they wanna meet more people of diversity, and I knew his manager, and I asked him about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. He immediately said yes, and he came. Well, thank you, Tava. So you can see what a character. Thank you. Not even know for me, like the Latino community. I mean, it's like, wow. <laughs> and I mean, because 11 years ago, I went to, a, a, you were a guest speaker, a guest speaker at Cal State San Marcos. You remember that? You went. It was. Have you been guest speaker again in that university? I, I, yeah, I do a lot of that, man. I, I, well, I, I was thought. 11 years ago. I was when I was a child. I was over there, and, and and I just went because I mean you were you were there. I was like, fuck, I want to see Edward James almost. I understood only 20 percent of whatever you said, and that 20 percent was Spanish, probably. But anyways, I don't remember what you said. But I mean, you're you're such an inspiration for to us Latinos. I like. God, you're like a demigod for us, to be honest with you. Like, well, if we were to be in the Clash of the Titans, we would, we would be like a god. But anyways, um, anyways, anyhow, anyhow, um, thank you for coming. Um, uh, have you done any work in Mexico, like any other Latin countries, or just the U.S.? I've done work. I haven't done films with the filmmakers of, of Latin America yet. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, extended myself and we're getting closer and closer. I am going to do a film. I, I started a film in June with John Sayles and it's going to be incredible. Uh, I love that guy. Yeah. I love his work and I love him. And uh, so we're going to do a film together. It takes place in Mexico and so we'll be working. But that's not a Mexican movie. Um, I hope to be able to do that soon, sooner than later. And uh, that's what my whole goal is. I've developed a lot of pieces over there, don't get me wrong. Um, mm -hmm. When I created Latino Public Broadcasting, uh, it was to give a voice to Latino product here in the United States of America. So we bring in you know, artistry from all over the world. But, uh, and then with the Latino Film Festival, the same thing. It's just, if you've never gone to the Latino International Film Festival, man, do yourself a favor, go. And if you, man, I got the best films. When you get the best films of any culture and you show them, you're going to get your mind blown. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, Separation. Did you guys see Separation? Yeah. A Separation, the Iranian movie. The Iranian the movie. Have you guys seen it? It won the Academy oh, yeah. Award for Best Film. When I saw that movie, I said, man, that's the best film I've seen this year. It was very difficult. Even the artist had a difficult time in my mind, compa yeah. comparing, competing with that movie because the honesty, the truth, the moment-to-moment -moment work that was done by those artists, those actors, and the, and the writing, and, the, and the, everybody, the lighting, everything, was amazing. I just couldn't believe that this movie had been shot. 
And, and I was amazed by it. Separation, you got to see it if you haven't seen it. It was the best movie last year. It just gives you also a glimpse into a different culture oh, and a different boy. society and a different way of living and thinking. That, once you get past that, because that's really what hits you in the, right between yeah. the eyes, you just get overwhelmed by the story. But when you start to look at the artistry of what it takes to make a movie like this and tell this kind of a story, then you say, holy mackerel, this is really incredible. The acting was just superb. I was floored. I mean, I hadn't seen that kind of work in a long, long time. It was so inside of itself, and it kept on growing and getting deeper and deeper and deeper. It just kept on going in and in and in. By the end of the story, you knew these people. They didn't have to say anything. They just like went through the feelings that they were going through, and you were reading everything that they were thinking, everything. It was like, oh my God. At the ending scene, when they're sitting in the hospital, I mean, in, the, in that the ward waiting for the decision of the judge, <laughs> I said, man. and they're just both sitting there, the husband and the, and the wife. And I said, oh my God. And they just went out like that. And, he, and, they, and they held the camera there for the whole credit and credits and live, real. And they just sat there, kind of like going through their changes, and you could read everything they were going through. It was yeah. so sad. Yeah. What a tremendous movie. Yeah. But anyway. Anyways, um, when you were talking about uh, uh, Mexican heroes, will you consider Cesar Chavez um, a Mexican hero? Oh, I wish they'd make him a, a, a national hero. Let me I'm tell you. I'm not talking about Julio Cesar Chavez, by the way. Yeah, I, wish <laughs> Cesar Chavez. They, I wish that they would make him a national hero. I, I'm, we've been trying to get him. They, they, they've declared a, a, a uh, day for him, but they have not made him. They, Martin Luther King is the only person of color that has ever been made into a national hero in this country, ever, ever. Think about it. It's as if the Africans and the Latinos and the indigenous and the Asians had nothing to do with the development of this country. God. Okay, time to fix it. <laughs> yeah, make those movies. Yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of color in this room, so make your movies. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Thank Olmos. You. Thank you. Um, now I can go home and talk to my Uncle Paquito and all this stuff. I, I spoke to God. <laughs> <laughs> Give him my love. <laughs> thank you. Were you going to ask a question? Okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's my height, so. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. You talk about how we should make movies to um, respect and honor those Latin Americans who did stuff like Mr. Escalantes and um, even Roy that you want to make the movie on now. But why did you choose to do your character in American Me? American Me was probably the most needed character of almost anything. It's a sister to this one. Um, if you remember in this movie, uh, um, Nethead, yeah. okay, Nethead goes out a lot with another kid, and they drive around the car, you know, Finger Man. Remember the Finger Man? Yeah. I know my ones, I know my twos, I know my threes. Um, so Finger Man gets busted in this film, okay, he gets, he's, he's on his way to getting busted, I should say. And then what you see in American Me is that same character comes in. And he, he, he has a whole situation on, on, in the story. He propels the story. He's part of the narrative of the story. And uh, he's one of two brothers where one brother has to kill the other brother because of the gang. And it really shows the gang mentality and connects the two ways of living. You can either study and move forward, or you can go to jail and learn that behavior, and what you're gonna get out of going to jail is what you saw in American Me. That movie has probably been the most effective movie made to help people understand. If you wanna go into that world, this is what you're gonna have to understand and face. If you don't, if you, now that you saw it, if you don't really wanna go into that world, get out of here and a lot of kids have changed their their way of thinking they've actually lived through that that movie they've seen it 25 30 40 times and and they see it over and over and over and over again not to learn how 
to get into that world, but to learn that world and feel satisfied that they know that world and now they don't have to go into it and they can go and do something else. And it's been very, very good. It's also a movie that's been used by all the penal institutions for all the guards. Every guard that becomes a guard, that they're training to be a guard, police departments too, they show that movie. And that movie's probably the, the strongest film made, on, made in prisons ever. I don't think Short Eyes, Short Eyes was made by Bob Young, yeah. my partner, he helped me make this one. And uh, we, we spent uh, one month in, inside Folsom Prison. And it was hard. Three, three people were killed inside prison while we were there. And uh, if you see the movie and you have the DVD, one of the specials, uh, the things that's added to the DVD is a, uh, a documentary that we made uh, on uh, American Me called uh, Lives in Hazard. And if you watch the documentary and you watch American Me and you watch Stan and Deliver, that's the trio. That's the journey. That's the real way to watch these films. So that's why I made American Me. <laughs> I'm very thankful that you, make, you made American Me. Um, it was one of my favorite movies, and I think that it also helped contribute to other movies like Mi Vida Loca and all those other ones that came out. And it really did affect the, the Latino market. I mean, not the market, but the Latino people to know how to mature. And so thank you for coming here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, you're done. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna ask a question? All right, nobody else? Oh no. No, no, no. Wait, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Ask the question. So you wanted yeah, to ask me some questions. Yeah. Okay. But you wanted to ask me some. Yeah. But go ahead. Him. Sorry. Um, hi, my name is Sukvir Sohal, and I was just wondering. I mean, you made this movie, this huge movie, and all those 18 students that were in. Have you ever actually contacted uh, contact those people or not? Those. Oh 18s? yeah. Yeah. We kept in touch? Yeah. I mean, I One of them uh, committed suicide. Mm. Um, another one, uh, the Nethead became an Air, uh, Air Force pilot. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The little girl that leaves to go to SC to uh, Anna. Uh, Anna, who couldn't finish the test. <laughs> Couldn't finish, and when she was 20 minutes early, she handed in. And she got a five. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, she got a four. She got a four. She got a four. And and but you know, she had, had she 20 stayed, minutes. She, if she had stayed, she would have got a five. But um, she went on to become. Uh, uh, she got her master's degrees. Everybody, everybody went to college. Everybody graduated. Everybody got graduate degrees. They That's all did. Too. I mean, once you could handle calculus, the rest of college was pretty easy. True. I mean, That's it was really like, oh, if I can do calculus, and then if I could do it like when I'm in the 12th grade, and I already, I don't have to take it in college because I already took my, I got credit for it already, you know. So they, yeah, they did really well. Everyone, everyone. That was the key to, the key to success is knowledge, and and once you're at that level, and math, is, like he says, is a great equalizer. When you can do math, you can pretty much challenge anybody on any level when it comes to thought. There's one thing that, that was mentioned in the movie. This is like a, in Latin America, in Mayan's time, there was zero. They invented zero, and they used zero. And I was sitting right there watching the movie. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There were also Indian people from India. They were using zero, too. And I'm like, hey, 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 we're the one who supplied to the Western side, the zeros, it wasn't the Mayans. It'd be interesting to see who created it first. The absence of value is different than the zero. Zero creates absence of value. Yeah. But the absence of value, the thought, the process of the mathematics that was used, It'd be interesting to see how far back it goes. And, and the way he said it, it, they did invent the absence of value. Zero. True. That's what he said. Now, I, I tend to believe him because <laughs> I'm from there. <laughs> and you're from India. Of course. And got it. <laughs> so we will go into a little discovery here and try to figure out where that mathematics came about. Yeah, I got about like one billion people right behind me. I just think that just the, I just think that the mind uh, the people, I mean, you know, they created that understanding 
which changed, of course, everything. The fraction was a big deal. I mean, we got into fractions, yeah. and, 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 and the understanding of fraction in mathematics that was incredible. But when they got into negative numbers, the absence of value, the zero, the world, well, what, what is computers? Zero, bless you, zeros, <laughs> zeros and ones. That's, That's all. it. Without the zero and without the one, we'd be in a lot of trouble right now. I know. <laughs> I don't know if we would have made it. And I guess, we, I guess like Latinos and Indians, they both contributed to Mayans and Indians when it comes to zero. I, I think that you have to realize that, that, that the, the key to the whole thing is that uh, I am, my culture is indigenous. I've been here for 40,000 years. My, my lineage. Okay, on, on my Olmeca, Baya, Mexica, uh, all the indigenousness of me comes here through the evolutionary process of expansion. I came from Asia before I was indigenous to this hemisphere. My great, 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 and then they came across the Bering Strait 40,000 years ago. We thought it was 11,700 years ago, but no, it's 40,000 years ago that they came across here. And they created, we found in, two, in 1994, we discovered that the oldest civilization founded in the Western Hemisphere is 800 years after the first civilization founded in Africa. 800 years is like nothing, okay? That means it was actually 5,000 years ago is when the first civilization in Caral, in Peru, the Peruvians were the first ones that created uh, a civilization. Yeah. <laughs> and Caral was the, where they found it. They, they just discovered it in 1994. And, and, and it was beautiful. And, and they found that they were growing corn and that they, they got away from the ocean and they stopped migrating and they stopped being tribes and they started living and farming land and became civilized and brought in water. So what that happened 5,000 years ago, <clears throat> we thought the humankind that came from Asia 40,000 years ago, okay, India is part of that evolutionary process that brought us here. So we were Indian from India and China, humans from there before there was any humans here. Because you, your land is over 100,000 years ago when your land was populated, 150,000 actually. Mm -hmm. Africa is where I started. I am African first. Asian second, indigenous third, mixed with my Europeanness because I couldn't be here without that. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me brown. That's what makes me who I am. So like when I see people, you know, African people, hey, man, I'm African too. <laughs> and I see my Asian, hey, you know, I'm Asian and African. I've just been out of the homeland a long time. <laughs> because nobody gets it. I mean, nobody really gets it. We all started in Africa. There's, all, there's two conceptual understandings of the evolutionary of man. And then, of course, there's the third is, is, is Adam and Eve, okay? Mm -hmm. But the two scientific studies are fr from Africa and out of Africa. From Africa, meaning that it started in Africa and then the, the human populated and went and started to grow and started to move out and started to evolve in, in different parts of the planet. And then the out of Africa, which is a very strong sense of understanding, is that they, humans popped up. Like what started it in, in, in Africa was started in, you know, up in, in the Arctic. And, you know, was started in different parts of the planet. And that's the two basic fundamentals. I believe in from Africa, personally. I just, the last DNA that we found remnants of DNA that is ours, human beings, was embedded in seven and one half million year old sediment. Yeah. Seven and a half million years ago, our DNA was in an animal that was found, the skeleton was found in sediment that was 
seven and a half million years old. What was that found? In Africa. In Africa? Ethiopia, yeah. yeah. It's the oldest remnants we've ever found on the planet. Now, look, at tomorrow they could go find something, you know, in, in, in India or China, because those, those are ancient, ancient people. They're much older than Europeans, much older. Asia and India, and all of you guys are connected, were, were this, I believe it was the second major evolvement. And from there came Europeans. That's what my feeling is, and there's a lot of us that feel that way, because that's how it looks. You can see it. You can see there's certain African tribes that you can see the European-based, you can see the Asian-based, you know, where the Asians come from. You see them in the African people. You say, well, that's an, it looks like it's Asian. <laughs> no, 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 it's African, you know? And, and it's not that the Africans or the Asians bred with them, mm -hmm. okay? It's just they evolved and have continued to evolve. So I, I love it, and I, I, I'm, if I hadn't have been what I'm doing today, I would have been an anthropologist. All right. I would have loved it. I just, I, I think it's fantastic, the story, to go back and understand yourself now by going back and, you know, finding out is fantastic. So anyway, per Thank you. Peruvians, you should feel very strong. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> you said that we're a mix of everything, right? Yes, you are. You have to embrace it. I can't tell you how many people, I can't tell you how many people my own culture have, have literally thrown rocks at me for saying this. I can't tell you. The first time I said it, and I'll never forget it, man. When I said it, I was with Cesar Chavez, and, and Cesar and I were talking, and, and we were, it was at an event for the Farm Workers Union in 1977, 78. And I got up and I said that I'm African first, Asian second, indigenous third, mixed with my Europeanness, and that's what makes me brown. Man, I got booed off the stage. Literally booed off the stage. And, and Cesar says, hey man, it's an awful big pill to try to swallow without any water. <laughs> and I said to him, as naive as I was, I mean, we were so, so young once, and I was so naive. I, I turned to him and I said, but I thought we were the water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we were yeah. young. We were young. We were young. I still think we were the water. <laughs> and we are. There we well, are. We are, we the are. people of the water. There you go, we there are. you go. Well, um, I have to say that this has been uh, more than we uh, really expected. And uh, Thank you. because it wasn't just about the movies, it was also about the world we live in. And if we had time, and if it wasn't at 10 o'clock, uh, I would ask you about many things. I was gonna ask you about 20 years to the LA riot, but that will take another time. Um, I know. That was tough. And, um, and also, you know, I noticed, like I was thinking about Selena, and there was a, a young actress, you know, and they cast you because you bring the gravitas to a project. I remember when, you know, Sherry Lansing always used to put Morgan Freeman in a movie because she said, you know, I know that I'm always going to get a good performance and it gives a dignity. And I think that you um, have the same kind of place in movies where you bring gravitas, high standard, and dignity, and you always know that it's going to be a good acting. And you have the Tony, the Emmys, and the Oscar nomination to prove it. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming here. Thank you.